Okay, I think people are making their way in. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people here today on this on this Monday afternoon, last week of classes. Um, really, it's our great pleasure today to be hosting and welcoming comics artists and graphic um, novel novel author um, Yasmin Omar Atla, who is going to be delivering a um, really wonderful presentation today titled Comics and the Humanization of the Middle Eastern Experience. So I really look forward to um, to uh, to learning with uh, learning from and learning with with Yasmin today. <laughs> all of all of the you know all of the, the the attendees who are here today. This is um, this is part of the Global Comics Lecture Series. Um, this is the second to last event of this wonderful series that's been going on this year with comics artists, um, really you know who represent experiences from all around the world. Um, Yasmin Omarata, who is with us today, is a Middle Eastern Muslim and qu queer and trans comic artist. Um, they are also a game developer, game developer and illustrator who creates arts, uh, art about coping with illness, understanding identity, dismantling oppressive structures, and Islamic futurism. So, so many different, uh, really wonderful <laughs> topics that um, that Yasmin is working on. He has a graphic novel titled Mishadra. Um, or maybe you pronounce it in multiple ways, depending on the, the play with words that you're doing here. With Mish Adra being, no, I'm not, I'm not able. Um, but um, there's a really interesting play with words, and I think I'm guessing you can pronounce this, uh, the title of your graphic novel, in in different ways. Um, this graphic novel has re resonated with both readers and reviewers alike for its searingly honest depiction of the epileptic, epileptic lived experience. Yasmin has also produced a video game called Being about the Palestinian past, present, and future. Um, I'm so excited to learn more about this and maybe play this video game one day. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Yasmin is a winner of many different awards, including the, um, the Ignatz Award and also um, Excellence in Graphic Literature Award fin finalist. So um, please join me in welcoming Yasmin Omar Atta today. Uh, we will um, first hear Yasmin's um, presentation um, talking about their work um, and ideas and um, and and the published work and the ideas that they have for their work and the, you know, the, the social significance of, of this work and afterwards we're going to take a little bit uh, a few minutes break between the presentation and the q a and then we'll engage in an interesting discussion after the presentation thank you so much for being here with us today Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone who's hanging out uh, for coming. Um, I love chat messages. I won't be able to see them while I'm presenting. But please, if you feel like chatting or asking questions or whatever it is while I'm talking, please feel free to type in the chat and talk to us. So, OK, I guess I will get started. Um, let's see. Okay, okay, one second, zoom. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Um, and also, mods, if for some reason my screen isn't showing correctly, please uh, feel free to open up and tell me. So, alrighty. Comics and the humanization of Middle Eastern experience. Right? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've only used Google Slides like once and I don't know how this works. Uh, Alright, so Hello, uh, if you signed up for the zone, you signed up for humanizing Middle Eastern people and our stories in a world that politicizes us and how we can convey these things through comics, uh, the intersection of queer, trans and Middle Eastern identities, past, present and future, and the importance of representation in art, healing trauma through comics and art in general. That's a lot of stuff, but you know, we're gonna try and cover everything and have a chill time doing it too. So here we go. Um, this is the Middle East. I know it seems like, you know, a kind of a, a basic thing to start off with a map, but at the same time, it's an important distinction to make between the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. There's a lot of similarities between all of us, but it's an important distinction to make. So when we say the Middle East, generally we talk about Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. So just wanted to make that distinction so everyone kind of has an idea of what we're talking about before we go forward. So, okay, that's the Middle East, but why does the world put 
politicize us this, in this region so much? Well, it has a lot to do with Western invasion and meddling, which also perpetuates the fear of us. There have been many times in the past where uh, colonizers and Western invaders will come in and cause a lot of damage uh, and then walk away and then act like, you know, we did something wrong and we're so backwards and we're so violent. So that's part of the reason why we're so politicized because we're constantly being put in this light. And because of that, many people, especially in the Western world, only care about the Middle East when something is wrong. Not really a huge fan of that. <laughs> so this, of course, bleeds into our community and art spaces. Uh, many spaces are really only so concerned with the Middle East when something is wrong. So that kind of creates a cycle where this in turn means that interest turns to Middle Eastern artists when something is wrong, when there's some kind of headline, when there's some kind of issue, when there's some kind of whatever it is, that's when interest turns to us. So that's why politicized art is expected of us. So my favorite phrase that I, you know, I and other artists get in emails and messages and stuff like that is, we want your take on the current problem in the Middle East. Not the best, not a fan of it. So <laughs> even in general, you know, progressive communities and allies in general, I know hearts are in the right place, but I find that a lot of times they tend to cherry pick what they want from us and when they want to hear from us. So but what about the rest of the time? You know, that's not, that is everything to our lives. We're human beings too, with multiple assets and multiple factors to our lives. Um, political art and things like that, it is important. It is important to have these things out there. It is really important to cover those things because, you know, all of our, the parts of our life come together and make one great thing. And politics and such like that is part of it. So um, it's important in that way, but that shouldn't be the only space available to us because we're, human beings and we have our own lives too. So just because, anyway, just like everyone else, our stories are valuable no matter what, and they shouldn't only be viewed as valuable when they're topical. Our stories are inherently valuable in and of themselves because of who we are and not because of the news headlines. So on top of that, there's the intersection with LGBTQ plus and Middle Eastern identity, which you know covers me, I'm queer and trans and Middle Eastern. So this is something that I live every day. And there's this sort of myth of scarcity when it comes to us, like, like there's not a lot of us or like we don't exist or it's impossible for us to exist, but that is not true. That could not be further from the truth. There's a lot of us and we experience oppression on all sides, not just because of, um, because of stigma of us, but also oppression in the Middle East. And, just oppression all around, just people either telling us that we don't exist or we don't matter or that we should be punished for who that we are. And that's why we need to be heard. It's not even like, oh, we should be heard, but we need to be heard because if people can hear our voices, they can humanize them. And if people can humanize and people can sympathize with people that are different from them, that stops the spread of ignorance and hatred. So it needs to happen. We need to be heard. Anyway, <laughs> that's sort of the the general foundation, the general layer of what we want to be talking about. Uh, when I was writing this, I said springboard, and I don't I don't know. I couldn't think of the right word. <laughs> so um, that's sort of the general info and the general thing that we're working off of when we talk about stuff like that. So anyway, um, we are here to talk about past, present, and futures, right? So we're gonna start with the past, particularly the past of queer and trans identity in the Middle East, because this is mad important. And people, I feel like people don't know this, but at the same time, as the slide says, we don't teach this in history class. This is not something that is common knowledge or very, you know, it's it's easy to find, but at the same time, it's it's not very talked about or thought about. So let's just, let's go. Okay, past, very quick, extremely quick history of the Middle East with regard to queer and trans identity. This is extremely quick. This is pretty general, but this is, you know, about as much as I can talk about in a webinar about multiple things. So I'm going to try and just give a very quick overview. Basically, this goes way far back. 
super far back. We're talking about Mesopotamia, Sumer, Phoenicia, Assyria, ancient Egypt, Akkad, like all of those that far back. That's thousands and thousands of years ago. That's how long that queer and trans identity has been present in the Middle East and been a part of society in the Middle East. So, and also, as it says, this map is a huge generalization. Um, it, this covers thousands of years, but at the same time, like it's really hard to find a map of all of these things. So I just put a quick one together. So I hope that helps as a visual for whatever, you know, if it helps make things like map out in your head. So <laughs> the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, is one of the first stories ever recorded and ever shared amongst human history. If you've ever read the Epic of Gilgamesh, actually, it's mad gay it is very much it's very queer in a really beautiful nice way i, I suggest reading it uh, i suggest checking it out because you know for a you know thousand something bc story it's pretty good and it is very loving and tender between the two male characters this passage which i'm not going to read out loud describes how the main character loves something like a woman and he's actually talking about his best friend, male companion. So it really is beautiful and really great. And I suggest you check it out. But anyway, that's the oldest story, one of the oldest stories we can think of. And it's queer. So I think that's very telling. And I think that's really great. And more people need to talk about it. So basically, the truth is that for most of history, the Middle East was very queer. Um, Pre-Islam Middle East, it was just a normal way of life. There's tons of records of queer relationships and just, it was normal. It was just a part of life. There wasn't really much uh, stigma or persecution about it. It's just like, you know, that's just the way it was, which is awesome. And even after that, you know, Islam, it is complicated and it has a reputation for being pretty bad about this stuff to say the least, but it used to not really quite be like that. That's actually, the the hard swing into that area actually is pretty recent uh during the middle ages um you know the areas in the middle east uh, especially in the sort of more muslim dominant areas there was still queerness about but in the golden age of islam which is you know we're talking about the middle ages uh the eighth century between the 13th century it was very very open about how commonplace this was but i honestly think a lot of historians they deny it. They, I, it's really hard to find like historians actually being honest and real about it and being like, no, this, this is a thing. Like this, these societies were very, very queer. And there's tons of poetry, tons of literature, tons of art about it. Um, even Rumi, even Rumi, his, his poems and he's believed to be very queer. And that's awesome. Again, it's something that I really wish was more common knowledge and more talked about. So that's why we're talking about it here. So there's also a lot of examples of trans identity being accepted in this history as well. There are Sumerian texts from, you know, as far back as uh, 4,500 BC, contains records of priests that are often transgender, and this was common and normal, and that's really cool. Um, there are records for a third gender, like, um, like, a, like a role, a recognized role in society being present in the Arabian Peninsula that go far as back as 17th century. AD, it's a bit complicated because since then, the third gender and the terms with it are a little complicated and it's uh, it's a bit kind of an issue right now amongst the LGBTQ plus uh, community and identity in the Middle East. But as far as that far back, 7th century AD, this was a thing that was pretty normal. Um, and much of the poetry and literature from that golden age in the Middle Ages of the Middle East um, the golden age of Islam, I should say, uh, which still affects the rest of the Middle East around it. Uh, it really diverted from the ideas of non uh, of then modern gender stuff. Like if you read these poems, like there are a lot of passages that actually sort of suggest that there's sort of a, a breaking of uh, gender norms that are present within then society. It's pretty cool. So for thousands of years, this wasn't as much of an issue. For most of the history in the Middle East, there weren't a lot of laws regarding sexuality. If there was legal punishment for something, for any sort of you know sexual crime, uh, usually homosexual, heterosexual was treated pretty equally. Uh, if there were laws, usually it was about preventing harm. 
Uh, it was about, you know, don't really hurt anyone. Don't, you know, don't do anything really bad and don't coerce anybody uh, in handful uh, so holidays. Don't be horny, but that's not about being gay. That's just like, hey, everybody, nobody be horny on this day. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, the Ottoman Empire did have sexual laws, but again, the golden age of Islam was very like, yeah, sure, whatever about it. And they were very open about queerness anyway. And in fact, homosexuality was officially decriminalized in the mid 1800s. So a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff there that isn't really, you know, commonly known, but it actually is a fact that these things were present. And there were a lot of times where it was very, very normal and very much a part of society. So everyone's asking what happened, right? What, what's going on? There were some cool things here that didn't, you know, didn't really pan out in the modern times. What happened? If you can take a guess, I'm going to give you five seconds to take a guess. Here we go. Here it comes. Colonialism happened. <laughs> and if you were right, you win 3d6 of psychic damage. I hope you have a high constitution stat. I haven't played D&D in a long time, so I don't actually know if it's the constitution stat. But anyway, 3d6 psychic damage, no refunds. I'm sorry. So here's the thing. In, I say ye olden days, but that really means thousands and thousands of years. But essentially, over a very long course of time in the Middle East, three religions formed. You have Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. They all have their differences, but also their similarities. Um, and they all have, you know, the diverging paths, but essentially they're all, they all have a large presence in this area for, you know, all of basically the time that they've existed. Unfortunately, at some point during the Middle Ages, some jerks, some people that, mm, mm, not a fan, uh, started really pushing these interpretations of the Bible that were very, very anti-queer, anti-trans, citing all that stuff as against nature and really, really taking a, a harsh stance against it. And that started spreading across the region. So meanwhile, in the Middle East, people are literally like writing poems and stories being like, being queer is awesome and I love it. And, you know, gender fluidity is great and it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I've seen art of it. I can't show any of it here. I'm sorry, but you get the idea. <laughs> And it's to the point where there are travelers from Western Europe who were coming to the Middle East and visiting, and they were really surprised at how open all of this was and how little discrimination there was. And there are like travel journals from around that time. But people are, are writing, I, I, um, some writers, especially from uh, the UK, I believe, um, just writing like, wow, this is really cool. And I had no idea. So that's pretty awesome. But it stopped being awesome pretty quick. Because in the 1800s, Britain started closing in on the Middle East, not just the Middle East, but also North Africa and South Asia and colonizing everybody, you know, huge problems. And, you know, all of these against nature attitudes and laws they had, they brought them with them and actually started taking over and enacting certain laws that reflected these anti LGBTQ plus stances. And it changed the landscape of all this stuff forever, drastically in a very, very short amount of time like 6,000 years, 6,000 years of recorded history of queer and trans identity being accepted, being part of society. And then in just about 200 years, it, you know, it is, it's fractured. That's awful. That's really messed up. And it makes me really sad because that is such, it's so sad. 200 years is, you know, compared to thousands of years, that's awful. So it's almost as if queer and trans identity has been a tradition, an important cultural asset of the region throughout the Middle East for most of all recorded history, almost as if really makes you think. So that's the past. Now we come to the present. Essentially, what we can take away from all of that is a lot of things. But one of the big things we can take from that is that our identity has been colonized, our history has been stolen, and our existence is politicized. And not only do we experience trauma from all that we inherit a lot of that trauma from the past. And we are essentially gaslit by the Western world at large. Um, and I, you know, I say gaslit because at, like, at such a mass scale, uh, colonizers brought in all of these anti-LGBTQ plus laws and prejudices, brought them in, 
turned around and left and then now they start to denigrate and attack us for being backwards and for being you know just so regressive and all these things like that and further stigmatize us really really makes you think so essentially we have a lot on our shoulders and we have a lot to heal from and basically our stories shouldn't just be limited to having to talk about these politics and these things have essentially been forced on us by colonizers and we should be able to talk about our experiences as human beings outside of that we have our experiences that are valuable and even though we're on a, a stage in front of the world politically that you know that shouldn't be the only thing and the only spaces that we're given in our communities and our art spaces um and the representation of such is incredibly important but unfortunately our general visibility is extremely low um you know i, I rarely see Middle Eastern, especially Middle Eastern queer and trans artists being openly represented. But that representation is incredibly important. Like I had spoken about before, um, representation and normalizing people being in spaces, it helps make these uh, people more visible and it helps them get their voices out and then get humanized and be more present for people who have are not used to that or are ignorant or, you know, just treating them a certain type of way. And if our voices become humanized and become real to them, it helps stop the spread of all of these hateful and really damaging attitudes. And thus we come to comics. I know it might seem like kind of a jump to go from there to here, but comics actually are, it can be a very important key to helping this all along. And that's because comics can do amazing things uh, for everybody essentially. It helps you express yourself. It helps you represent yourself. It helps you connect with people. It helps you uh, start building a community to help you heal yourself and to speak out into the world. You know, it, it is a, a accessible way of expressing who you are and your feelings and your experience. And to represent yourself is incredibly important. Um, for me, part of the way that I started doing stuff was because I realized that no one was going to offer me a chance um no one was going to just come up to me and be like hey we want to hear your story we want to hear you uh queer trans middle eastern um you know epileptic etc like muslim we do, you know no one's going to come up and tell me we want this like guaranteed i can't count on that so if you know if i'm not going to get that chance given to me i have to make my own chance and that's how i started drawing that's how i started making mishadra that's how i started doing a lot of things and that's how I started making my voice heard. And I really encourage people to, hey, like represent yourself, put yourself out there. And if your voice needs to be heard in your community, you know, just go ahead and do it. Don't let's like, don't wait for someone to give you permission because it probably is never gonna happen. You know, be yourself and put yourself out there. And if you do that, you can connect with other people around you. And in that way you can start building a community and all of these things can really help you heal and grow and just become the best version of yourself you can possibly be. So that means the future rests with you and your art. Make whatever you want to make and show who you are and what your experience is. This is incredibly valuable uh, for, as we spoke about and what this you know presentation centers around the Middle East. You can show everyone your life isn't just what the world stereotypes us as. You have the power to share your experience with everyone around you. Um, when you're doing this, you know, I, I suggest people, if you're starting this and you really want to share your experience with the world, choose a medium that feels relatively comfortable for you. Don't stress yourself out too much. Uh, and the most important i honestly think one of the most important parts of the expression of comics and, and sharing your experience is zines zines are awesome they're accessible ways of expression and healing and honestly zines are the future so um zines i know there's a little bit of a um a contention as far as what zine means and i've seen people argue that zine means a, a large uh, color bound book with multiple people uh, contributing and, and printed and that can be considered a zine but really what it comes down to a zine started as it remains a, a small messy comic something that you put together really quickly something that you didn't 
aim to be great or to be something so grand, something that really expresses who you are and what you're about and something that you can easily pass around to other people and something that you can you can give people a slice of yourself. And I think that is incredibly valuable for, you know, the future and what we're trying to do here to humanize and get our voices out there. So yes, zines are the future. Zines are wonderful. <laughs> Unfortunately, can't do a full zine workshop here because uh, this panel is about a lot of things. But, um, you know, if you're not familiar with zines, I highly suggest looking into zine workshops, looking into any resources, extremely valuable, extremely accessible way to get yourself and your voice out there. So I know it can be very hard sometimes for people to get started on something kind of vulnerable and hard for people to kind of put themselves out there and even sometimes to unpack the things that they want to talk about. So I suggest if that's something you really want to do, but you're having a hard time kind of figuring out where to start, I, I say ask yourself some of these questions to help you start a comic or any art that may help you heal or help yourself and others. You can ask, how can I show the humanized side of my experience? How can I really put myself out there and really tell people who I am outside of these news headlines? You know, how can I do that? How can I show something that I've struggled with, but I have never felt like I could talk to people about face to face? This is something that I have really went through making Mish Ezra. Uh, my comic and my book about being epileptic is I had struggled with it for so long, but I just didn't have the words. I couldn't tell people what was going on with me. I just didn't have the words for it. And even if I did, it's so hard to tell people face to face in the moment. It's so much harder than you think it is until you try to do it. So that was a big question for me starting to make that comic is I have something inside me that is hurting so much but i don't know how to say it i don't know how to put it into words and all i can do is make this art and that helped me immensely like i can't even measure how much that helped me and that's why i encourage this to a lot of people um because there's something about my trauma or my experiences that is negatively affecting me and i want to work through it but i can't figure out where to start this also applies to other um, things such as illness and, and such is it is okay for it to not know where to start when you're looking to heal or you're looking to really put yourself out there. But if you can start to recognize like, hey, there's something I really need to heal from and sort of dig deep in that way, then I think you can get to a point where you can start making something that's really going to help you. I had this experience as well. I'm currently making a game that's been in production for a very long time because it's a side project, but I started making a video game um, that was me saying there's a trauma that I have that needs to be healed. It's been on my shoulders my entire life and I have to do something about it. And that's when I started making the game. And even though it's not finished yet, I, I feel every time I work on it, I feel even more weight lifting off of my shoulders. And on top of everything, if you think, hey, I am, my identity needs to be more represented. I need to be more visible and not just myself, but people who are at the same intersection or similar intersections of my identity need to be represented in our spaces. That is as good of a, uh, a reason as ever to start making something because even though it might not be immediately uh, visible, it as far as like, sorry, not immediately obvious as to why that could be healing. Again, putting yourself, your identity, representing yourself is healing in the way that it heals sort of the people around you in a way it starts to heal prejudices starts to heal and and show people something that they had no idea and on top of that it, it heals people around you who are in a similar spot and really need this and that's why all this can build such an amazing community so when you're making comics and an art that is something that you're really trying to make something vulnerable or make something healing. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. And part of the reason why I like to, you know, talk about this to a lot of people is that when you think about art in certain mediums, especially comics, it seems like there's sort of like a template you're supposed to follow and that can make it really hard to approach. Like comics are, for some reason, there's very much this idea that comics is very obsessed with the sort of square boxes it has to be perfectly gridded out rule of thirds this that and the other uh that is not true uh these sort of like tightly put together square boxes layouts and such like that like 
That's not true. That's a lie. <laughs> you can make whatever it is and you can like put it together however you want. And like I said, really feel it in your heart. And that's part of the way that you can really start expressing yourself is if you can realize, hey, a lot of these preconceived notions about this medium is not true. <laughs> Let your comics be messy and imperfect. Don't worry about being good. Good is an illusion. Good is a, a lie told to us by uh, school and, you know, etc. cetera. <laughs> so good is illusion. Don't worry about that. Just when you start to get into art that you really are trying to be vulnerable and heal yourself, ultimately what matters is how much it means to you. So keep all these things in mind. Um, when you really want to start doing something vulnerable like that, I also suggest to people I, I, the idea of kinesthetic visuals, which is in non oral space, I guess. Both of those things really mean don't be hung up by the literal. Don't hung up, be hung up by, I have to draw this thing good. I have to draw this thing accurate. I have to do, have everything put together and line up with each other. You know, instead of that, really focus on how you feel, how these things that you're struggling with. And, you know, for example, we're talking about Middle Eastern experience, how these prejudices really affect you and channel those things into your art. And don't worry about things being good or accurate or literal. You know, I, I would rather see, you know, a, a big page that is all swirly and difficult to read and, you know, all, like a little bit confusing in a way. I would much rather see that than like a, a perfectly in perspective bedroom when it comes to how you really feel and what you want to express. So don't worry about those so much. Um, let me see what I have next here. So. Here are some examples from me, if that's okay. I hope it's not like annoying to be like, here's what I did. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I was having a lot of trouble with Google Slides at this point, and I'm like, I don't even get it. I've, again, I've used this like one time. So, so thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience. But some examples from me is when I, for example, when I'm talking about my illness in particular right now, but this can apply to, you know, most anything that has to do with your body, your feelings, and, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to work through. Um, I, you know, I stopped using the convention of these little perfectly aligned boxes um, and started changing things just to be like, this is the way I feel. So I mess with the idea that panels have to be squares that look directly at you because when I'm having a particular type of seizure, I feel like I'm not in the same place. I'm not in the same dimension. I'm not in the same space as everything else. And it's really hard to describe that to people. So, you know, I just said, I'm going to do what I can to make this feel a certain type of way. So there's more examples. Sorry, I don't want to give too many examples. I feel awkward doing it, <laughs> but I figured it might be interesting. Um, this is from a different comic that has yet to come out, but I hope that this is at least interesting to look at and maybe like, oh, okay, interesting. Um, that's enough of that. No more examples for me. <laughs> We're almost done. I feel so awkward showing my own work in these things. Okay, so something that also really helps with really channeling your feelings through art. When I was in school, I had a professor named Keith Marison. And in his classes, one of the things that he said um one day when we sit down and we're talking about whatever it is he just is talking about comics and he says read tezuka read tezuka read tezuka exactly three times in that inflection <laughs> and i was like okay i guess i'm gonna go read tezuka uh osama tezuka if you're not familiar uh is the creator of astro boy and kimba the white lion he's also done tons of com tons of manga tons of things, animations, etc. Um, and he has so much work and he is revered as a very, very important figure in the history of manga. Uh, and there's a huge reason for that. Do it. Read Tezuka because Tezuka is so inspiring in the way that he drew and portrayed feelings um, and portrayed all of these things. Um, these pages are from a, a scene in a story where the character is is on the brink of life and death. Uh, he got into a car crash and, you know, he's sort of slipping away. And these 
pages are really expressing that and really expressing how it feels to be in that space. Um, the page on the left is the start of a scene where the character is in surgery after the accident and can't see, like can't see things as they are, can only see things as lines, as ver uh, horizontal lines. So I think these are all incredible examples of how things feel. And here is a, a spread from pages where this character is going under anesthesia. So there are a lot of examples of these. And this is, I think, a, these pages, uh, Tezuka's work is such an amazing example of what kinesthet uh, kinesthetic visuals are. Actually, I'm pretty sure Keith Marison coined that term. So <laughs> thank you, Keith. Uh, lots of great advice. So I'm, you know, I hope that passing it along also helps other people start to really dig deep and make art that means a lot to them and really shows who they are, really helps them work through things. And also, if you know, it's not obvious from these slides, uh, Tezuka is one of my greatest influences ever. So great Tezuka. Oh, and there's more. I think this is also while a person is in surgery as well. So you get the idea. Um, take a look at some of his other stuff too, but make sure to look up content warnings as always. Um, and <laughs> the page on the right is from a character being injured and passing out and what it feels like to sort of slip from consciousness. And this comic I believe was uh, made in like the fifties or sixties. So that's the original real boy with wolf head for all of y'all who like that stuff. He's great. So anyway, we talked about a lot as far as, um, you know, history as far as the present as far as the future as far as how important making art that really shows who you are and represents yourself how important that is um but there are other ways to support each other and these tie into it um on the screen are some organizations that are doing work uh for lgbtq plus support and shelter and rights uh in particular, uh, Helm is working to annul anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in Lebanon specifically. And Rainbow, there's Rainbow Street who's helping people not only in the Middle East, but also in North Africa. And yeah, so there's um, organizations out there that are really trying to put in the work. So um, there's also Mamul Press, amazing independent press that is focusing on publishing Middle Eastern and North African artists. Um, they are amazing. They're really elevating voices out there that really need to be heard. They uh, they actually are distributing one of my comics as well. So they're really, really great and really, really putting in that work. And if you're not Middle Eastern, you know, take part in some of these organizations or even just elevating Middle Eastern voices in your community is incredibly important. That that allyship and helping that visibility is incredibly, incredibly helpful. So can also get in, involved with online Middle Eastern community and support Middle Eastern artists and organizers. Uh, on screen, I have the names, websites, and Twitter handles of some amazing Middle Eastern artists um, and some incredible friends who are doing, um, you know, comics, uh, illustration, game design work, uh, writing, and also community organizers or involved in community. And uh, Nix is a tattoo artist who's amazing. So. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll linger on this a little bit, just so if people want to screen cap or if they want to write it down, please go ahead at your leisure. I'm going to take a sip of my beverage because I'm parched. <clears throat> okay, everyone got their screen caps. Okay, good. So yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff that we just went through and there's so much more that we could talk about. And I, you know, a lot of this is just very, scratching the surface. And we all know from our own experiences that it's very hard and that we go through so much. Um, but we have the power to represent ourselves. We have the power to create art that heals ourselves and resonate with others. We have the power to be seen, to be validated outside of news headlines and outside of people's preconceived notions of who we are based on prejudices, based on our identities being colonized, based on all of these things. We have the power to rise above that. And that power rests with us in our communities. So let's do our best. Thank you. <laughs> We're very grateful to our sponsors, the Ohio State University Center for Latin American Studies, Center for Slavic and East European Studies, and East Asian Studies Center 
with funds from the US Department of Education Title VI grants and to university libraries. I would like to acknowledge and thank Shannon Niemeyer and Christina Adams who are behind the scenes making this session possible and give particular thanks to Magdal Sherbini, the Middle East Studies Librarian for the OSU Libra University Libraries who has planned this event. And now um, I, I do want to introduce, although she's been with us uh, this whole session, Johanna Selman. Um, Johanna is assistant professor in the OSU Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Her research interests uh, include contemporary Arabic and Francophone literature, migration literature, gender studies, and Arab diasporic theater. She's going to join us as moderator of the Q&A. And Yasmin will be back in a few minutes. Hi, Johanna. <laughs> um, so if, Johanna, did you have anything you wanted to say at this point? You're muted. Uh, I just wanted to thank Yasmin for this for this presentation. Um, and as we have this chance to take a little bit of a break, or um, do you want to get started? Yes, yeah. I mean, but please go ahead and say what you're saying. I didn't mean to interrupt. So just um, everybody, there is a Q and there's a Q and A box where you can put your questions. I know people have been posting into chat as as well, and um, if you need to take, need to take a moment to just let some of these ideas sink in and think about what your question is, that's um, that's wonderful too. But um, you know, keep keep your questions coming, and we have a little bit of time now to um, to have a to have a conversation with with Yasmin. Yeah, yes, and please, please, I. I just was um, taking a sip of my beverage and looking over the chat and I see I see some friends there. So thank you. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you all. And just thanks for listening to that whole presentation. I know sometimes I go on a little bit more about like feelings <laughs> rather than like, you know, very like clear bullet points. But, you know, I hope that it was interesting <laughs> that it helped. So yeah, I'm I'm ready to take some questions if, um, if people have. So it looks like there are several questions where people are looking for um, examples of books and comics that you've enjoyed, maybe that have inspired you, or books and um, graphic novel novels, comics that um, you know that do the kinds of things that you're talking about in this in this talk, you know, human, humanizing Middle Eastern experiences, using um, using the image to um, to talk about trauma, these kinds of things that you're talking about, are there particular, um, especially maybe Middle Eastern artists, um, comics artists, book artists, um, that are doing the kinds of, kinds of work that you that you see is really important? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm not sure if you saw the, the slide that I put up earlier, but there's so many artists doing great work. So many Middle Eastern artists who are doing amazing work, um, just really putting themselves out there. Um, yeah, so if you saw the slide, you know, you see there's multiple people, um, you know, Bela Abdel Razak, uh, Marguerite Dabai, Nadia Shamas, Sarah El Faghi, um, multiple people really doing amazing comics. Uh, it's hard for me to pin down graphic novels specifically. Uh, I know that they're out there, but ultimately for me, the things that have done uh, the most impact and the most um, that I can see very easily and things that I can see really uh, out there and accessible to people have been sort of smaller work. So I would suggest if going back and maybe uh, checking out that slide and checking out the people that I just mentioned. So I hope that's enough an answer. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of questions here. Um, somebody's okay. asking, where can we see your art and comics? Like, where would you recommend that people go to um, you know to gain access to either purchase or, mm -hmm. or see your art? Um, yeah, so if you just go to my full name, uh, yasminomorada.com, that's my website, uh, and you can find everything pretty much there. So thank you for asking. So I think we have a few questions here. I think relating to the really challenging question of, you know, how do we, is it possible to get outside of this politicization of, of, um, of, of art? I mean, there, there's a, there's a, um, there's a question about, um, you know, why scratching the word Israel from the back? <laughs> and, and there's also a question about, um, you know, the, the question about the history of what are the views on marriage and monogamy and in, um, in is Islamic his, 
history. So I guess some of these questions, it seems to me like what, you know, there's questions that are very specific to particular issues, but also mm -hmm. um, to me, it seems like these questions also point to this question of, you know, is it really, you know, is it really possible to get, um, you know, to the outside of politics um, when you're mm -hmm. do, doing when you're doing this kind of art? Um, the thing, it's a tough question because I don't know if it's completely possible to remove politics from the equation because a lot of the politics uh, include our identity specifically. So I think a lot of it is really hard. I don't know if it's 100% possible, but at the same time, I don't know if it's 100% possible to remove something from like its context and from the world at its point. So I think it's important for us to make work that is specifically not about that, but I don't know if it's 100% possible to just be like, no, it's not a thing. I don't think necessarily it's possible for any thing to really do that. Like, I think that art individually, individually things can do that, but as a whole context is, you know, context is context. So I hope that that helps. Yeah, I think, so. I mean, there, there's, a, mm -hmm. you, there's some specific um, questions that pertain to very specific texts. And if you want, sure. if, you, know, you can see the Q and A, um, if there are particular ones that you want yeah. to answer. Sure. But, um, Let me see. I think yeah. this last question is really interesting that Nadia Rajab is asking. What are the stereotypes around Middle Easterners that are perpetuated by media and pop culture that you think are overdone or need to be need to be avoided? Um, I would say there's quite a few, but I would say sort of like the very um, how do I put this? The very like violent, the very like reactionary, the very um, you know militant sort of Middle Easterner is uh, is a stereotype that's a huge problem. It's massive. I see it everywhere, and it just perpetuates that same thing, the same tired old false narrative that this is just who we are like it is really really damaging um especially like i i wrote in particular one uh at one point a comic specifically about palestine but very much talking about the movie true lies which is horrible anti-palestinian propaganda but it's an american classic and people watch it all the time and depicting palestinians the way that movie depicts it is incredibly harmful but it's on tv every single day and people love the movie you know, you see what I'm saying? Like it, so it's a gigantic type of stereotype that needs to be avoided, definitely. Yeah, it was, it was we were just finishing watching uh, the film Real Bad Arabs, the documentary in our, in our, in our class. <laughs> I think, and I saw, and I saw on your, uh, on your website also that you, mm. that you do a similar kind of thing where you're responding to particular, um, you know, films in, in the US, particularly US pop culture and, um, and there was a question here, maybe relating to, um, you know, the, the place of comics in in the Middle East. Somebody, um, David Lasky, is asking. I know very little about comics in the Middle East. I wonder if there's any comics there. I'm thinking about the Muslim artistic tradition of masterful calligraphy and architecture, rather than representational imagery. I don't. I mean, this is a big question, and I know seeing who's on among our the members of, of the audience i know there are lots of people who know a lot about comics here and of course you mm. uh, as the expert on um <laughs> but you know I'm not an expert. <laughs> as a, as a, you know I'm, I'm, you. I'm curious if there are particular i mean maybe ways to answer this question i'm thinking if you're you know maybe like the from like the, icon, the iconic figure of handala in in palestinian uh culture to um the place of comics for children children's books in um in, in the middle east or the place of comics more generally um are there maybe i maybe particular things that you want to say about the, um, the place of comics in the middle east or maybe particular artists that have inspired you um sure so the thing about the middle east is um you know there's a lot of you know faith a lot of religions a lot of um a lot of things like that but you know it when we're talking about the middle east we do have to talk about islam even though it's not the only thing there it has greatly influenced and shaped the region so um when it comes to middle eastern art and specifically muslim artistic tradition it is a little bit of a contradiction because um you know islam tends to be very uh iconoclastic where you're not supposed to depict 
specific figures. You're not supposed to depict these literal people. Like it's not supposed to be like that. So that's why you get um, sort of the, the patterns. And as uh, David Lasky is saying, the representational imagery and the art coming through the architecture and things like that. So it a little is a little bit of a contradiction. And I, I recognize that, but you know, uh, so as far as how comics are received in the Middle East, it's a little bit hard to answer that because I, I know that there is like a little bit of resistance, but at the same time, like, <laughs> I don't really allow that type of attitude in my life. You know what I mean? So I don't really speak a lot to people who find that sort of thing a problem. Um, I know that probably amongst more traditional Muslims, there might be an issue. Um, I do know that uh, there are great comic publishing uh, things happening in Lebanon in particular. Um, I have a couple of friends who have had comics published and distributed in Lebanon, which is awesome. So I think that that's a particular place where comics culture is really flourishing. So. Yeah, we have um, a really interesting question here about the relationship between art and, and healing. Um, by Deborah, so hi, hi Deborah. Um, hi. So uh, I'm interested in, um, Deborah writes, I'm interested in hearing more about the relationship between art and healing, both for the artist and the viewer. You talked a little bit about how when you work on the game project, so I think that ga the game being, um, um, you, you feel the weight lifting. Is there more you'd like to say or other artists or writers who talk about this healing who have influenced you? Thank you for the reference of Tezuka for the visual representation of, of body states. I'm glad that you like them. Thank you. Uh, let me think. There's a lot here. Mostly give me a second. Um, I would say, honestly, when it comes to specific artists and writers, I would say that when I think about the influence of specific writers and artists who talk about this healing, I really think of just every community as a whole. I know that's kind of a non answer. But when I think about who is really doing these things that resonate with me, it really is just such a group effort of a community that unfortunately, I wish I could pick out names off the top of my head right now. But the first thing I think of is just really everyone in these communities putting in like the work and really being vulnerable for themselves. So I'm sorry, I know that's kind of a non answer <laughs> for that part. Um, let's see. Let me think about the rest of the question. Sorry. Um, when you work on the game project, you feel weight lifting. So more I would like to say, um, yeah, I think that if you feel the need or you feel the push to make art about yourself and your healing and you know things that you're trying to work through yeah uh sometimes when you get to that point it's just it does a healing for you unlike anything else really of course there are completely multiple ways to heal there are multiple ways to work through and everyone's journey is their own journey but i would say that making art about these things and really clearing through a lot of trauma and a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration. You know, my, my game being is a lot about Palestinian past, present, futures and about like frustrations about them. There is a, a section of the game that is very much about um, like allies whose hearts are not really in the right place, sort of putting us on sort of like stages to sort of look at and treating our art as a sort of spectacle. So I, these things are really important where it's like, it's not just, it's, how do I put this? There's just something about it that is so unique. So um, as far as what more I'd like to say, I, I don't, I guess that's really the heart of it is that there's just so much you can do and that there's a level of healing and, and also understanding and that you can come to with art that is just so unique. And that's why like, I think, you know, while I'm talking and I want to presentation, like I'm kind of like getting excited about it because like there's just so much good to be done, not just for yourself, but for other people. Yeah, I'm thinking also how powerful it can be for other people to recognize some of their own struggles mm -hmm. in, in, in art, or even if they're not recognizing their own struggles, just, you know, connecting to to someone else. Yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry, if I could just. No, yeah. 
Um, I would say, so, you know, after making Mishadra, you know, some very kind of people have come up to me and say, hey, like, you know, I read this. It's really, you know, sort of helped me understand certain things. And what people, I think, don't realize is on the, the flip side of that, someone coming up to me and saying that to me helps me also. You know, it, it helps me just as much as maybe the book may have, hopefully in some slight way even, helped that person. Someone coming up and saying, hey, this thing really helped me is healing for me as well. And is really helpful for me as well because it is validating and it brings you closer to somebody and it starts, um, you know, making ties within a community. Sometimes you can really build really amazing uh, parts of your community just from simply having that one conversation of like, hey, this really helped me. And if the other person who made it feels a certain type of way as well, like it can really be an amazing thing. So I would say those type of things when people come up and say, hey, this helped me, that is also extremely helpful for me as well. So, so that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, yeah, that's, oh, you know, those are more that I would want to say about that particular thing. I would, I would love to just take the liberty to ask you a follow up question and there, there are other questions here in the, in the chat that we'll get to as well and just, you know, of course, everyone keep them, keep them coming. Um, I was wondering if first of this game. Um, being that you, that you that you say is about you know about past the Palestinian past present and and future mm -hmm. I was curious first of all if you're connecting it to all of this really kind of amazing um future writing that's happening um in the Middle East but maybe specifically there's a lot of um kind of futurism in Palestinian art and mm -hmm. and and literature these these days and I was wondering if you you know Maybe maybe there's a connection between this idea of, of healing and, and being able to shape the future through through this through this game, like have some kind of agency in creating a, a future. I don't know if that's how you were thinking about it, um, but also I was just wondering if you if you are willing, like maybe could you talk us through this game, what it's like to play it, and you know yeah. what we, what you might see in the game, and what kinds of choices are available in the game. What are the you know what what are the constraints? What are the possibilities that are presented mm -hmm. to the player? Sure. Thank you for asking. That's really nice that you want to hear about it that much. Thank you. Um, spoilers, by the way, if you're planning on playing it, big spoilers. It's it's like 45 minutes long. Um, basically, the uh, the premise of the game is that you are a space cadet and that Palestine essentially has moved to space. That is where the Palestinian diaspora is located in space. I mean, the, most of the planet is not inhabited anyway, but for the most part, you have a colony. This is the Palestinian diaspora. Um, and you are a space cadet, part of that colony, and you are sent on a mission back down to, you know, essentially the ruined earth, down to uh, the land that used to be Palestine and will be. Uh, and you are sent there to gather artifacts from the past and, you know, just sort of bring back those things so they can be archived and not lost. And so when I say past, present, and future is, is you crash land essentially into a house uh, on accident. You know, you must be a new cadet, I think. <laughs> uh, and so you crash land into this house and there are three rooms. And, you know, I talk about my love for the non-literal. There are a couple of rooms that are not literal. They're not actual rooms in a house. Like these are sort of imaginative spaces that represent and the one room that you do go into that's literal is representative of the past and you find family photos and you find an old tape recording and, and things like that. Um, and then the second space you go into is a space I was talking about in the present where, you know, there are people whose hearts are not in the right place who are not, you know, not helping. There are people who are just really um, putting us on a stage, really doing that kind of thing. And so that middle room is very representative of my at the time feelings about how people look at Palestine um, and how they treat Palestinians and Palestinian art as sort of a spectacle and not something to really be resonated with and not something to really take seriously. Um, and the last room is, I won't, you know, I won't say exactly what it is, but it's representative about how the, the walk to the future seems so slow and it gets harder and harder the longer you go on it. It just like it, it, it feels like it's never ending, like a path to a place that you can get to where you can feel at peace, not just, you know, Palestinians as a whole, but also yourself as a Palestinian. So 
that's essentially what the game is about. And for me, it was really important to sort of make that game um, because I feel like a lot of people when they think about Palestine, they don't think about a future, you know, like we say like, oh, you know, the resolve in the conflict or whatever, but I really find that a lot of people, when you really think about it, they don't think about Palestine as having a future, you know, um, it, it doesn't exist to them uh, for us to exist in a time of peace you know, for us to exist in a place where we should be and where we are. So that's why it was important for me to make a, a game about the future of Palestine and um, really show people like, hey, Palestine, like Palestinians have a future and you know what, like, hell, we can be in space too. <laughs> like, but people don't really think about Palestine being able to do those things, you know what I mean? So that's why it was really important for me to make a game set in the future that also addresses the past and the present of our time. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Thank you for asking. And I'm thinking um, there are, um, I have a suggestion here because we have so many experts on kind of libraries and, co and comics culture and, um, you know, how to access these things. And I know, Yasmin, you probably have some great ideas you can share as well. We have some, uh, first of all, we have a question where somebody is asking you um, if you can say a little bit more about your love of, of zines. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to add to that because there's, a, there's another question basically about how to, um, how to access or how to, how, you know, how, you know, this is maybe for um, librarians or mm -hmm. Middle Eastern studies librarians or librarians in general who would want to buy more Middle Eastern comics and zines from the libraries in order to break down these stereotypes that we're talking about. And it's saying, but it can, they can be hard to get a hold of because they're produced in small runs and not distributed by our vendors in the Middle East. Um, so the question is, can you recommend channels to obtain them? So my suggestion here is because I think we have so much expertise and I would re really want to hear your um, suggestions, Yasmin, but I, I was thinking this might be a, a question that would be really productive to crowdsource in the chat as well. So yes, please. So yeah, of course. Can. Yeah. Um, so I would just want to encourage everyone. We have so much expertise in this room, in this virtual room, if folks can share um, where they've been able to access and, and purchase um, comics and zines from, from the Middle East or Middle Eastern diasporas. And I think that'd be really useful for, um, for folks to see. Um, and then if you wanna add anything, Yasmin, about that, or if you wanna add any, you know, talk about a little bit about your love of, of zines and how you, um, how you came to that. Sure, yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, please, like you said, um, people, if you have suggestions or whatever it is, please, because, um, as you said, we we could all use this information. It's all very valuable. And I would say a great place to start would be the press that I mentioned, Mom Will Press. Um, if you go to their website, um, they are doing really amazing work distributing these zines and making sure that people can buy them, can buy them in bulk for their stores, and they're doing amazing publishing. And so I think that is a great place to start if you go through them and you know start getting stuff start talking to them um you can also branch out from there and check out the artist's other work as well and that opens up a huge world for you to explore as far as these artists goes so i would definitely suggest starting out with mom will press yeah thank you so much and feel free to you know when you think of if you think if you think of something go ahead and share it in in chat as well Yes, I'm sorry. My hair is like driving me gungaga. <laughs> I'm sorry. I keep playing with it. So, anyway, please go ahead. <laughs> so, there's a really interesting question here about um, the primary influences for comic culture in the Middle East, and I think this is really complicated and interesting question. You know, the question is: Do you feel like it's mo it's mostly influenced by Japanese comics and manga anime, anime, or perhaps from the French or Kof Belgian comics culture, or even American styled superhero comics? Um, I'm curious what the role colonialism and the artistic style of the, of the colonizers may play in influencing comics in the region. Could you speak to this to this at all? I think this is a really interesting question, given how um, you know Algerian comics culture is different from um, from from Lebanese, um, very um, very different from Moroccan. Um, so I think if you have any, um, you know, if you want to share some ideas mm -hmm. on, on the different styles that are circulating in, in the region. Sure, um, I can't speak as much about uh, Tunisia and Morocco just because um, you know 
uh, they tend to be more North African um, mm -hmm. region. And I, I like I wouldn't feel comfortable like speaking in particular on those two areas. Um, and it's hard to parse out how I feel about colonialism uh, and influencing comics. So unfortunately, that's something that I would kind of have to think about a bit more. So I'm sorry about that. But I do know that there is a, you know, there is a giant like manga and anime scene in particular um, an appreciation um, especially within the gulf uh, and there's a you know lots of influence lots of love um, for uh, manga and anime out there and I, I basically all of these examples that you're giving are all there mm -hmm. you know as far as uh, french slash belgian uh, and american superhero all of them all of them are out there. Um, my father had issues of um, Tintin. So <laughs> he had issues of Spider-Man um, back overseas. So I can't say exactly as far as like the nuances of how colonization has affected comics in particular. That's like a bit more, again, a thing that I would kind of have to meditate on and form more of a definitive answer on. But I can say that comic culture really is influenced by all of these things. They're all there. Uh, we have a question here about your experience, uh, you know, moving into book publishing after after working in zines and, and game design. So Kat Fajardo is asking, um, coming from a zine game design background, what was a transition into book publishing like for you? Any advice for those hoping to follow in your footsteps? Cat, I love you, Cat. <laughs> That's my friend. I love you, Cat. You're the best. Um, coming from zine and game design background. So transitioning to book publishing is interesting for me because um, Mish Adra, uh, you know, first and um, like premiere, you know, and right now only second one's coming soon. Graphic novel. The thing about it is I didn't write the story to be published. I wrote it myself. It was a web comic when it first came out. It was definitely one of those things, like I was saying, where I was like, you know, I have this thing that is really hurting me. I really need to talk about it. I don't know how to talk about it in just words. I got to make something. No one's going to give me permission, you know, all that stuff. Um, so Mish Adra started as a web comic and just me updating it by myself, you know, um, and just me doing it. And it wasn't until a friend sort of, you know, hooked me up with a like their agent who, you know, is great, who looked at this and said, if you know, put it all together, we can publish it. So the comic actually was not made for publishing. And that's why I it's interesting. Like I really suggest to people make what you want to make and make things about who you are and not just to be published, because of course you're gonna have to make things be published if you're gonna go into third party publishing. But at the same time, like the work that is very much you and very much like your heart and soul like sometimes that's the work that either gets you there or the work that is the most important to you when you're publishing so that was my transition was just making something by myself and making something that i really needed and then having it getting published from there um yeah i guess you know that's kind of nebulous advice i wish i had a bit more of like do this do that don't do this don't do that but i i don't really have that just because that was my transition. That's the way that I got into doing this. So, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm just really grateful because, um, you know, just a, sorry, a little bit of an anecdote. Uh, Mish Adra got turned down by eight publishers flat in a mm -hmm. row. Uh, and so that was like another thing where it's like, people are not going to give you permission. And that's why you can't wait for permission. I'm very grateful for my publisher, uh, Gallery 13, who, you know, really loved it and wanted it and gave me the opportunity to put it out there as this you know big book but yeah just i would say do what you want to do and go from there sorry i know it's very nebulous i'm sorry <laughs> i was curious about what you're working on right now and what you've been working on during this strange period that we've been living through and maybe what you see yourself um, working on in the future yeah, so um, I am currently working on a second graphic novel. Actually, I just turned in all the final pages last week. <laughs> I think uh, you and I were actually talking when I was like, my deadline's in two days. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I just turned in all the pages for that. Actually, I don't 
know if I can reveal like the name and stuff about it yet. I'm not quite sure how that works and I don't want to like do anything to like mess anything up for anybody. Um, but my second one is coming. It, I don't know, it's exciting. I, I hope you enjoy it when it comes out. Right now it's slated to come out by the end of the year. So other than that, you know, I, even though I am in third party publishing right now, I'm very much about, you know, just doing the, the small work that I love. So right now I'm working on multiple games. Uh, I have a couple of comics projects that are almost done, but kind of had to be like, okay, I have to like, you know, do my like paid for work first. <laughs> so, but they're, you know, they're almost done. I have multiple smaller projects that I have in the works right now. So I hope you enjoy them when they come out. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering also about these different, all these different art forms that you're working in. Um, do you feel like the graphic novel affords you a kind of space that the, you know, um, and time maybe in developing it that the zine doesn't just, you know, uh, the games, do they, do they create a different kind of artistic, um, mm. you know, or potential for, you know, developing art and ideas? Um, are there particular topics? Um, so I'm curious about how you're feeling about these different art forms that you're working with. And if you feel like there are particular art forms that lend themselves well for, you know, working through or, and, and exploring these particular um, topics that you're, that, you, that you're exploring in the work. Sure. So I definitely talked the most about comics and a little bit about games during the presentation, just because that's the most of what I do. But I hope that, you know, I think and I hope that a lot of what I've talked about can apply to other art forms as well. You know, um, illustration, writers, I know a lot of people who are doing different mediums and I, I try and I hope that what I've been talking about can be applied to those things. Maybe not exactly in the right way, but the general, not the right way, I should say the um, like a 100% like a one to one way, but I hope that at least it can help a little bit. Um, as far as comics and games, so when you say comics, you mean like zines as opposed to my graphic novel, or do you mean both? Yeah, like the web comics. Okay. Web comics and the zines. Sure. Um, as compared to these book projects, the, the graphic novels. So as far as zines go um, and smaller comics, I find that those tend to be quicker and they tend to be, you know, you can have them be a bit more messy. Uh, you can, you know, you're not necessarily always working with an editor. <laughs> like, so you just have the ability uh, to just be completely out there. Like I said, be messy, doesn't have to be good, doesn't have to be uh, a certain type of way. You can just put yourself out there and really be you. And so I find that zines give that space uh, very quickly and very easily and they're also a lot more accessible because zines can be made you know pretty much for anybody if you have the ability to manipulate a, a drawing tool of any kind you can make a zine so um i i find that those in particular are um more accessible and sort of easier to get things out quickly in a more raw way uh graphic novels of course can send these amazing messages, but it's just a different vibe. It's just a different process and it takes a long time. Whereas a zine is like, you know, you could do a zine in one night if you wanted to, like, I don't suggest it, but you could, uh, cause you need to sleep. Everyone needs to sleep, get sleep. Um, as far as games go, games are interesting because games are definitely more difficult. They're definitely less accessible. Um, I, and, you know, kind of gatekeep you too. Like I used to think like, oh, I'm not smart enough to make a game. Like I always thought, I thought that for a long time because that's kind of just this culture that sort of built around game development for a long time. But that's not true. You know, you can make a game. Anyone can make a game, you know? So it, it's just a matter of finding resources and finding programs that are intuitive to you. So whenever people say like, I want to make a game, but I'm not sure where to start. Um, I say, you know, try to access uh, RPG Maker software, which is a easy to learn and pretty affordable, uh, if not free, uh, software that is really, really good for learning things quickly and really sort of like being like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, that's easy to, I understand that. And it's called RPG Maker, but you can make any type of game you want in it. That's the program that I work in um, primarily. and 
you know, if you use a software like that, that is easy for you to learn and you don't have to stress yourself out too much, then you can start getting to the point where you can make games pretty quickly and easier. It is always, I find, it's always going to be a bit more stressful because you have to test for bugs. You have to make sure this works and that works and oh no, the game broke again. Oh geez, what happened this time? I thought I programmed it right. That thing, you know, like Zoom, that should have worked, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? I don't know. Like that, so that part is definitely stressful. Um, I think more stressful than making zines or small comics. Uh, but the trade-off is different because when you make and play a game, especially when you're playing a game, this is really important to me when I was making Being, is that you put someone through your steps. You know what I mean? Like you are putting them in a place where they have to be analog and they have to live the experience and they have to play through it as opposed to reading, which I love reading. I love comics. I love it all amazing, but there's something in particular about games that puts you in that position. And that's why I was really focused on being, being a, being, being a game first. I made a companion comic later, but I really wanted to put people through the paces. So the trade-off is a bit different and the experience is a bit different. They're both valuable um, and graphic novels are valuable too. It's all just very different. It's a matter of picking like I think I mentioned on the slides, like pick a medium that is not too stressful. Like, you know, you can challenge yourself, of course, but when you're really trying to make this raw work, um, finding the medium that you find to be the most accessible uh, to you, you know, that part is really important. So I think I want a little bit of a tangent there. Sorry. <laughs> Great. I, I love seeing the way that you're um, in Meshadra, for example, the way that you show you know those experiences that, that are difficult to put into words but they can maybe be more represented in 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 images i was also curious about the title of your game being um why did you choose the title being for um for, for the game like just such a common word like it's just like it doesn't stand out at all but that's kind of the point because people hate us and despise us and and you know do horrible things to us simply for being simply for existing doing nothing else but just existing on this earth and so it it's really sad it's the most basic thing you can possibly do as a living being is to be to exist and that is what we're being persecuted and hated for um and i really wanted the, the title to be just that basic word because that is you know that is what we are doing we're just being so that's why i named it that Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for asking. I wonder if there are um, if there are final questions, uh, please go ahead and um, and type them into the Q and A or even into into chat. Um, Nina is sharing some really important information on uh, the um, the last Global Comics Lecture Series is coming up really soon on Wednesday with John Crespi with a talk titled "The Real and Serial in Zhang Leping's The Wandering Life of Sun Mao, 1948." 1947 to 1948 sorry and um, Nina has placed the link in the, um, in the in the chat where you can register for that for that talk so any um, any final questions or um, yes mean if there are any final things you want to share with with us today sure um I just want to I'm gonna look at some of these questions real quick um Let's see the platform for my game is both um for windows and for mac os x if you go on the um the page that it's on you can download it either way um i see someone is asking uh to see my book in contrast to some of the other books uh, about epilepsy in the graphic medicine community of comics was i aware of any of these when i was making my story do i have any other thoughts or reactions to other stories so i actually wasn't very aware of the graphic medicine community um, at that point with my epilepsy and uh, my illness and what I was going through I, I, f I felt very sort of alone in that aspect not necessarily in my life I had you know amazing friends who were trying their best to be there for me and they really were putting in amazing work and really helping me a lot but as far as art goes I, I felt sort of very like mm -hmm shrug uh so i i wasn't aware of well i think a lot of things that either came out then or are coming out now i definitely see that graphic medicine has grown incredibly and it's really amazing um uh yeah i how do i put this 
when I started Mishadra, uh, the only book that I knew about, or really like the only, I guess, comic I knew about at the time that was about epilepsy was David B's Epileptic. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe it's called Epileptic, right? Um, and at the time, people kept telling me to read it. And I did, like, I, I read it. And of course, it was important because it really put stuff out there. But I was kind of bummed because it was written from the perspective of someone who was watching somebody have epilepsy, you know, uh, someone who was very close to them having epilepsy, but not from an epileptic or someone who has seizures themselves. And, you know, that was kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm glad the book exists. It's a good book, but I just was kind of like, oh, like no one, you know, I, I just felt like, oh, like, I really wish I could have read a book about this with someone who has oh and then you know i started writing one myself so um oh uh do i have any thoughts or reactions to other stories or these other stories i would say not necessarily about you know like like i mentioned the, the graphic novel i just mentioned but i will say that when i see a lot of things in graphic medicine, honestly, like I just, I cry because it's so beautiful and so amazing that people are really putting themselves out there. Um, and really, again, like, like we had talked about just really being raw and vulnerable, not just for themselves, but for other people. So I cry a lot when I read graphic medicine uh, comics, just because they're so incredible. So, sorry, <laughs> those are my thoughts. They're mostly feelings. So, but, you know, I tend to be more about feelings. So. I think that might be about it. I know someone's asking about a copy of the resources that I posted. Um, I believe that this is going to be archived, correct? Um, so you should be able to see the presentation there. Let me see, I might screen cap it and post it to an account if um, if people didn't get a chance to look at it. That would be wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. Any other? Follow-ups, further comments, less comments. If anyone has any more questions, but I think that's about it as far as what we might be answering. Um, yeah, I guess so. I the last one was the resources, so I think that's about it. Unless anyone has any final questions for me. I don't see any more, although I bet. Others will come to mind as soon as you sign off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you know, if you have questions, um, you know, you can email me uh, or you can at me. Um, I will, if you know, if I feel comfortable and if I have an answer that I feel like I can speak on, then I will respond to you. That would be wonderful. I want to thank, uh, thank you so much, Yasmin, for joining us. This was an amazing, amazing uh, experience for all of us. Johanna, thank you. thank you for your um, great moderation of the questions. Um, yes, thank you. We would love to have you back sometime in person on campus <laughs> when, when that's possible. So be awesome. our fingers crossed that um, there will be that option sometime in the n- near future. <laughs> that would be so great. And, you know, thank you all for having me in the first place and thank all of you for your hard work. I, you know, I know you all put a lot into making this happen. So thank you all for your hard work again. And just thank you for everyone who came out and, you know, listened to me ramble for 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it was rambling. I think uh, we had a, a rapt audience out there. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, stay boy. tuned. Um, so when we are able to bring Yasmin to campus, you, you all will know about it. Um, I'm and thank you all for attending, everybody who, who's out there uh, listening. No, it's really great. So with that, I think that we are going to close. Um, there's still comments coming in. So uh, <laughs> many Love thanks. That. Yeah.